have what are obviously some penetrating questions. I will answer them as succinctly as I am able to do, and as frankly. Are you saying that A. Kuiper said God gave mandate to the church to transform the culture? Yes. That was exactly what Abraham Kuyper said, part of the calling of the church is, transform the culture. And he attempted also to do that in the Netherlands with results that leave something to be desired. Are you saying that Abraham Kuyper is condemned for his teaching of common grace and the wrath of God lies upon him? I did not say that. I did, I did not say that Abraham Kuyper is condemned for his teaching of a common grace of God, but I said that Abraham Kuyper's doctrine of common grace is condemned by scripture and by the reformed confessions, and that that great man to whom we are obliged for some blessings we reform people today erred grievously with regard to the doctrine of common grace and that he has done a great deal of damage to many nominally reformed churches and confessing reformed believers by his doctrine of a common grace of God. Is there still a problem with common grace if it isn't attached to Christianizing the world. The purpose of common grace as taught by Abraham Kuyper was exactly to Christianize the world. It's hard to separate that purpose from the doctrine of common grace itself. What other purpose would there be for the teaching of a doctrine of common grace? But my judgment upon that doctrine is that with regard to Christianizing the world, it is mistaken, has done great damage to reform churches and Christians where it has been adopted and practiced because it leads to fellowship and cooperation between the church and the wicked world by virtue of the world's supposedly possessing this common grace in common with the reformed believer, reformed believers and the church may cooperate with the world in bringing about a supposedly good and holy society and that's fatal to the church, which is called by God to be separate from the world, and not to cooperate with the world in building the world's earthly kingdom. There is no biblical basis for the doctrine of common grace. And there is no biblical teaching of any purpose served by a common grace of God. Where does the Great Commission fit in your kingdom? The Great Commission is Christ's commission to his disciples upon his resurrection to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures. And by this mission work everywhere among all nations, God gathers his elect people out of all nations and thus gathers his church so that Christ may come again. But the Great Commission, neither in its wording nor in its implication, has anything to do with a common grace of God or a purpose of God with a common grace. The Great Commission is bent on the conversion and salvation of God's elect people among all nations, tongues, and tribes. So the Great Commission has an important place in the 
gathering of all the citizens of the kingdom and in the establishment of the spiritual kingdom of Christ, which is, as I have demonstrated from the Heidelberg Catechism, the church. If we are not to Christianize the world, are we called to be Christianizers? That is, are we still obligated to preach and witness in all places and in that way be Christianizers? Christianizers is the term of the one who wrote the question, not my term. The Bible nowhere calls us to Christianize the world. And the thing is impossible. The world, by definition, is the unregenerated, unbelieving world of ungodly men and women. They can't be Christianized. They can be converted to Jesus Christ by the preaching of the gospel and the operation of the Holy Spirit in their hearts individually, but that's different from Christianizing. And we certainly are obligated to preach and bear witness to Jesus Christ in all places, and in that way, this questioner says, be Christianizers. And I would rather say in that way of witnessing and testifying to the truth of God in Jesus Christ, we show ourselves to be Christian witnesses. So we certainly are called to preach and to witness in all places. The preaching gathers the elect of God out of the nations and makes true believers out of God's chosen people. And our witness, individually, as we have opportunity, may be used by God for the gathering of his church, but also to confound and shut the mouths of the ungodly. Is it correct to reserve the term grace for the covenant relationship between God and man and to understand so-called common grace as the operation of God's providence. And then, by the way, congratulations on 50 years this week of ministry, and thank you for your work and writing against federal vision and for God's covenant. That last remark is gratifying to me. Thank you for it. Now, with regard to the question itself, Reserve the term grace for the covenant relationship between God and man. Yes. And understand so-called common grace as the operation of God's providence. In the past, there have been reformed theologians who have inaccurately described God's providence, his government, of the lives of all humans once in a while by the term common grace, but that was a mistake. And it would be better to purify and rectify our language. God, God governs all creatures, including the devil, by his providence. That's simply his almighty power. Grace is different from God's almighty power. As soon as you begin to describe God's government, let's say, of the devil or of reprobate, ungodly people as something done by God's common grace, you fall into a serious error and an inaccuracy of language. Use the word grace, as the Bible does, to refer to God's saving operations in Christ upon his elect people with regard to his government of the devil and of all human beings, use the word providence. Why do people like Chuck Colson and other dispensational premillennialists push for a cultural Christianity like the Reconstructionists? That is a remarkable recent event and development among dispensationalists. In the past, dispensationalists have been concerned only with one thing, the deliverance of themselves from earthly life and its activities by the rapture. 
Now, recently, a man like Chuck Colson has emphasized cultural activities by Christians for which he appealed to the power of common grace and therefore uh, supported the teaching that's prevalent in the Reformed churches that there is a common grace of God upon all human beings without exception. I can only speculate what moved Chuck Colson to push for a cultural Christianity. He never explained exactly why, differing from other dispensationalists, he made a big point of this. I can only imagine that he saw, both in scripture and in experience, that there's more to the Christian life than just waiting for the rapture to take one out of this life and put an end to one's earthly activities. And therefore, began to emphasize the importance of certain cultural acts on the part of Christians, which he also then uh, implemented in various ways. But with regard to Colson, as with regard also to reform persons, those activities must not be ascribed to a common grace of God, but if they are legitimate, those activities in society are to be explained by the working of God's sovereign, saving grace in us that produces genuine good works and movements of genuine good works. And those who say we must Christianize the world, and that is the context of the kingdom coming, are they not saying that the kingdom has not come? Galatians 1.13, is not then Christ not victorious? Does Christ not help? Those who are advocating the Christianizing of the world probably would not deny that the kingdom has begun to come but they would insist that the kingdom must come before the end of the world in a much more dramatic and complete way than the kingdom has come so far. Certainly they would have to acknowledge that the kingdom has come already in the obedient life of each child of God, but they want a coming of the kingdom that is more dominant and widespread so that at least outwardly the kingdom of God controls all of the earthly life of a nation and all of the earthly life even of all the nations of the world. And their mistake is that that perfect coming of the kingdom of Christ, which influences all aspects of life and dominates, is reserved by Christ to take place at his second coming. Now the coming of the kingdom, as I pointed out in my lecture, is the rule of grace in the heart of the individual child of God so that the individual child of God lives in obedience to the will of God in every area of life. And the kingdom has come in the form of a true church characterized by the pure preaching of the gospel, the right administration, of the sacraments and the exercise of Christian discipline. How did Christ, how did Kuiper reconcile Christ's kingdom coming through Christianizing the world with his statement that common grace would bring forth the Antichrist? I doubt if Kuiper ever reconciled those two things because those two things are irreconcilable. How can a grace of God produce the Antichrist? And that really was Kuiper's teaching. Granted, he referred to God's common grace, but it was a grace of God that Kuiper said would produce the Antichrist. I think that borders on the blasphemous. God's grace does not produce the Antichrist. The grace of God delivers from the Antichrist. And the grace of God unites to Jesus Christ. As far as I know, 
Kuiper never elsewhere tried to reconcile these opposite facts. Common grace could bring forth the Antichrist. Nor have I seen much comment on this aspect of Kuiper's teaching about common grace on the part of those churches that have adopted Kuiper's common grace. We'd like to have them reflect on and explain that, according to Kuiper, common grace is going to produce the kingdom of the Antichrist. The American Revolution has also been termed the Presbyterian Revolt. The early Americans were heavily Calvinistic, but they did not submit and pay taxes. Instead, they revolted. Were they wrong to do so? I don't deny that some Presbyterians were involved in the American Revolution, but I'm not so sure that the American Revolution was mainly a Presbyterian revolt. They disagreed with my judgment, I guess, that the biblical calling to the citizen is to submit even to unjust office bearers or officers of government and pay taxes, but that is certainly the calling of the Christian citizen in Romans 13. And that passage also forbids revolting so that whatever may have been the thinking of the Presbyterians at the time of the American Revolution, they erred in engaging in civil revolution. And then a question with two words, rapture, question mark, nonsense, question mark, yes, explanation point. Does anything restrain evil? There are many things that restrain evil. Policemen restrain evil. Parents who supervise their children's lives restrain evil. There are other restraints as well. Could evil in the world be greater? Theoretically, it could, of course. If the restraint of government and the threat of punishment were removed, there would certainly be a greater outbreak of evil. But the point is that this restraining of the outward expressions of evil is not to be identified with a work of grace upon the hearts of ungodly people that make them better than they otherwise would be. And that was my concern in my speech, the teaching of a common grace of God that restrains evil so that Unregenerated people are not as totally depraved as otherwise they should be. Every unregenerated person is totally depraved, even though one may express that differently than another, and even though the lives, the outward behavior of many are restrained by the threat of punishment and police and so on. Could you explain your comment on the kingdoms not to have influence. Could you explain your comment on the kingdom is not to have influence, considering the parables of the kingdom in Matthew 5, 13 through 16? I'm afraid that somebody misunderstood what I said or I didn't make myself clear. The kingdom of Christ established in our hearts by the Holy Spirit certainly has influence, and not only influence, but governs the thinking and behavior of the born-again child of God. So that, as I attempted to point out, in every area of life, we live the life of the kingdom of Christ in obedience to the word of God in Scripture. And if it does have influence, albeit not without persecution, 
will this not be manifested in all spheres of life when it does have gospel influence? Amen. The establishment of the kingdom of Christ in the heart of the individual child of God will show itself in every area of our life and must. A personal life, a marriage, a raising of our children, our work, our behavior in the state, everything. Did God establish a covenant with Noah and all his descendants after the flood? And did God establish the world to be ruled by kingdoms, earthly, according to natural law? The covenant with Noah was misunderstood by Abraham Kuyper as a covenant of common grace as though the covenant with Noah was not the covenant of special grace established in Jesus Christ, and that was Kuyper's mistake. The covenant with Noah, and in Noah with all the nations ultimately, is the covenant of God's saving grace in Jesus Christ. And what God especially made plain in the history with Noah was that his covenant and kingdom with Noah would eventually be a covenant and a kingdom that would dominate the entire world in the day of Jesus Christ. But the covenant with Noah was not a covenant of common grace with all human beings without exception. That's the last question. Therefore, I conclude my presentation and defense at this point.